Welcome to the second season of Occupy TV, where we discuss the issues that gave rise to the Occupy movement. This season will feature people both national and local, from journalists David Barsamyang and Norman Solomon to the Cascadia Forest Defenders and Deep Green Resistance. Today we'll be talking to Daryl Cherney, who made the film Who Bombed Judy Berry, as well as some folks from Occupy Medical about their work in downtown Eugene. We've got a great new set, but we'll continue to talk about the issues that gave rise to the Occupy movement, such as economic inequality and the erosion of our civil liberties. Welcome. is the new drug and that's what I feel like <laughs> because because when I'm here I just don't feel the, the separation the anxiety of you know what I might term the default reality that we usually live in you know go to work pay rent and we personally know nine people that committed suicide because everything they worked for was gone because of a foreclosure and the foreclosure happened because of variable rates and the banks didn't modify. So every single one of those lives could have been saved. A New York Times article reported yesterday that you are a confused liberal activist fed up with partisan politics but have no real ideas of your own. Um, we at the medic tents um, all across in 15,000 cities across the world are here volunteer only, not being paid, because we believe in the power of people cooperating together. Mike Check! Mike Check! Peregrine! Peregrine! You lost your passport! You lost your passport! We hope you get it back! We hope you get it back! So if I could have a role in making the United States more of what I feel it should be, more of what I feel like was the original goal of the founders, then that's something that I want to be a part of. Build something new. I want to see a whole new civilization, not based on greed, but based on compassion. If this movement works properly, I don't think there is an end to it. But that's an honest enough statement for you. It's kind of scary to think about for a lot of people, I'm sure. But if this movement works properly, there isn't an end to it. Everybody starts working for everybody, rather than everyone working for themselves. My name is Sue Sierra Lupe, and I am the clinic manager for Occupy Medical. We have a free clinic downtown that we started back in October of 2011 when we were working with Occupy Movement. Initially, we thought we were just going to be offering first aid. It was clear very quickly that the people that we were serving needed help with much more serious conditions. And because we had such a skilled staff, we were in a peculiar position, we could help them, and we did, and we are continuing to do so. We have been offering free services with doctors, nurses, pharmacists, podiatrists, dental hygienists, uh, you name it, since February 5th of 2012. We also have a free dental extraction clinic that we offer to our patients. What our objective is, is to show Oregonians what single-payer health care will look like just walk in the door, it doesn't matter how sick you are or how much money you have or what kind of insurance you have, you walk in the door, you get health care. That's it, it's really that simple. Welcome back to Occupy TV. I'm Camilla Mortensen and we're here today with Sue Sierra Lupe, Clinical Director for Occupy Medical and Dr. Lee St. Louis, who volunteers with the Occupy Medical Clinic. And we'll start right in to find out how you both got involved to begin with with Occupy. I'll go ahead and start. I, uh, last March, I saw an article in the newspaper explaining that there was a weekly free clinic downtown affiliated with Occupy. And it said uh, that Susie Arlupe was the contact person, so I emailed her. It's almost a year ago. Yeah. 
That's right. It seems like it's been a really long year. <laughs> and Sue, <laughs> when did you get going? Um, well, I started with Occupy before the camp started. We went to some organizational meetings, and that was at the University of Oregon, and then we moved to a, um, another place on Polk where we had larger meetings. And uh, we set up a medical tent and arranged volunteers, and our assumption was it would just be a first aid tent, but eventually, eventually people discovered that we were there and offering free medical service, so more complex cases showed up and uh, we just found ourselves monitoring them as if we were a clinic, but we needed more structure for that. When the police set, shut us down on December 22nd, then we watched our patients go away and we couldn't, we couldn't do that. That wasn't acceptable, so we ne still needed to provide care for them. And a lot of the care was fairly significant care for very, very serious conditions that needed to be constantly monitored, but because people don't have health insurance, it's just not being monitored. And so that's what led to the ongoing Occupy yep. Medical? So uh, February 4th of last year, we decided to put together a clinic and just have a free clinic every Sunday and people can show up for four hours. And we organized our volunteers and got our schedules together and got a whole bunch of donations and set it all up. And that's what we had. We originally at the federal building mm -hmm. and then we decided that it would be better for our patients if we were at the park blocks which is still centrally located and it is on a Sunday and one of the ideas about having it on a Sunday is the other options for Eugenians is to go to the hospitals that are in Springfield okay. so um, we wanted to provide them with another option so that's uh, what people have been taking advantage of us ever since then in I believe it was October, we got um, a grant that came through to buy the bus that we currently have. It's a 35-foot Bluebird uh, former blood mobile, and we are retrofitting it into a mobile clinic. And we just pull up, and then we have another larger tent that we set up for intake. We also have free haircuts there, and we have a variety of other services for free. Um, socks, toothbrushes, sanitary items. Um, the haircuts are provided by a gentleman who used to work at London Hair for Design, and he just provides them for free. I call him the first um, volunteer for the uh, mental health committee. <laughs> and that was going to lead to my question, which is uh, what, uh, what effect does things like, things like haircuts and that type of thing have on people? Well, it, it's really magical to observe. I mean, our volunteer, Benjamin, work so well and so patiently and so gently with people that they end up sharing things about their life and they end up um, finding uh, through that sharing other resources that are available that they did not know about and they just people need to be touched and when you're getting your hair cut it's safe and it's loving and it's gentle and you're also feeling like you're accomplishing something mm -hmm. so some people say oh no I don't want or need a massage but I'll take a haircut everybody needs a haircut so that's a really safe uh, space for people to be in. And we've had volunteers that have come through and that's one of the services that they can get as a thank you for all their, their hours and hours of services to get a nice haircut. So it serves as a thank you to our volunteers. Also for our patients, one patient came through who was, had just been beaten by the police and um, he had a lot of medical and mental health concerns and he was really rattled and shaking and obviously injured. And one of the ways that we were able to help calm him down was get him a haircut. So he sat down, he had to stay still, and he had, he'd stay calm. And he just was treated with respect and dignity, which since the beating was not something he was used to, and it just brought him into a place where he felt safe with himself and then we could help him with other things. We were also to able to provide medical care to him outside in the tent because he wasn't comfortable coming onto the bus at that point into a confined space. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the medical clinic, we really have a lot of latitude in being able to treat people and meet them mm -hmm. where they are. Yep. Can you tell me a little bit about the process that people go through as they that they come to the clinic? Mm -hmm. For the most part, people come and check in at our intake tent, which is outside, and they uh, give our intake worker their name, and uh, <clears throat> we're working on trying to give people an estimated time mm -hmm. when they can be seen, because it's first come, first serve, and, and sometimes we end up with a long line at the start of the clinic. 
Um, but of course, people quickly realize they don't have to stand in line. They can walk over to Food Not Bombs and get a meal and then come back. They can go and walk their dog and come back and be seen. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, they come onto the bus and are seen by our triage nurses who take their vital signs and kind of get the initial picture of what they're there for, whether they need to see a dental worker or a doctor or a wound care nurse or a mental health worker or just get a haircut, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, uh, often multiple services are needed. Mm -hmm. and so all these services are uh, provided by volunteers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Beginning to end and everything is free. So you get your assessment, it's all free. You get the exam, it's all free. You walk out of the bus with herbal supplements or nutritional supplements. We figure out a way to pay for those prescriptions over the counter medication. It's all free. It's all a model for what it'd be like for a patient to get uh, single payer health care. That's this is what it looks like. You know, there's no reason to be feel guilty. We're all part of a community, and a healthy community is a happy community, and we all want happiness in our lives. <laughs> so this is how you do it. Yeah. Okay. And it's not, uh, the most important thing to me is that it's not, you don't have to come to our clinic and prove that you're poor enough mm -hmm. to need our services. Mm -hmm. You don't have to show us that you're uninsured. We see a lot of patients who are insured. We see a lot of patients who are insured, they are employed, they do have a primary doctor, but they're not able to see their doctor when they need to. Uh, so we're really showing what it would be like if people really had direct access to health care uh, regardless of their income status. And what kinds of cases are you seeing? Uh, what kinds of cases aren't we seeing? Yeah. We yeah. see everything. Uh, our, our physicians are all board certified family practice doctors. Mm -hmm. So just like myself, the other doctors are uh, primarily focusing on chronic care, not so much acute care, although we're skilled with that too. So we do see acute care cases like someone with acute injuries caused by violence. Uh, but we also see people who come in on a regular basis to have their diabetes monitored, to have their asthma monitored, children getting well child checkups, uh, things like mm -hmm. that. So just like a, like a regular clinic, except that we do combine the acute and the uh, you know, continuing health maintenance mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. And dental hygiene. And dental hygiene. And the Gorilla Hair Salon. That's right. And mental health. We have a fleet now of counselors and social workers who help our patients mm -hmm. with often very complicated uh, prob financial uh, problems obtaining resources. And I understand nutrition is sometimes an aspect, uh, lack of nutrition. Most definitely. A lot of our patients that come to us, some of the, the impetus for their these diseases that they now have is from malnutrition, and we're seeing that not just in homeless. We do have a large population that we serve that's homeless, but that's only approximately 40 percent. But working class people, um, the lower middle class, et cetera, they're all coming to us with uh, nutritional concerns that cause us a bit of worry. So since we're seeing it beyond, I mean, the, the magnesium deficiencies, the vitamin D, uh, the vitamin D mm -hmm. that just, Anemia. you name it, we're mm -hmm. seeing all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. that makes me concerned about what's happening on the larger scale. Mm -hmm. And the fact that people can't identify that and yet they're coming for a completely different reason, but we're letting mm -hmm. them know there's actually a way for you to just change your diet a little bit, starting in vegetables, have a piece of fruit every day, this will help build your body back up so you can heal yourself for the reason that you came in in the first place. Okay. Um, and it sounds like the clinic is fairly holistic. It seems to involve a lot of different, mm -hmm. uh, both treatments and then also uh, processes. Can you talk a little bit about that? So you were talking about herbal um, medicine as well as sort of more conventional medicine? Yeah, one of the great advantages of our clinic is that everyone's in the same spot within a few feet of each other. So when we have a patient that by the time they've gotten to the third station, they've revealed they actually have something else, everyone can get back together and talk about that and offer treatment that the patient can choose. And we are emphasizing 
patients choosing, that's how you get patient compliance because it suits the lifestyle that they currently have. A person that has a house has resources that a person that's living on the streets does not have and there is no shame in that our job is not to judge, our job is to heal. So by just being open and smiling and friendly and asking questions, we find out a lot about things and the fact that people are seeing a variety, a diversity of folks, then they are sharing different parts of their life and so we're able to help them on multi-levels. You know, in many ways our clinic is really very sophisticated and provides state-of-the-art health care and health maintenance because really you'd have to go to a place like the Mayo Clinic in order to get your primary care and your mental health care and nutritional advice and a wound care nurse mm -hmm. and a podiatrist and yeah. you know all of these resources under one roof except that our roof is a bus and it's a, a tent. Bus. Yeah, does your doctor talk with your pharmacist while you're there in the room? <laughs> I don't know that I've ever Probably seen that not happen. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. here it happens. Mm -hmm. What are some of the uh, barriers to health care that you find that comes up for people? Why do people need to come to Occupy Medical or why have they not gone to a doctor previously? Wow, uh, there's so many answers to that question. A yeah. lot of people, they have insurance, but um, for instance, their insurance, uh, there's only a, a small amount of doctors that they can choose from, so those doctors have a full gamut. Mm -hmm. And even when they're prioritizing the more urgent cases, still for people that have bronchitis or they have asthma, they, they have their appointment five months from now. Mm -hmm. And when you're out of an inhaler, you have to have a prescription. You need it today, and a lot of doctors in group practices, uh, especially working with a new patient, they're not comfortable giving those prescriptions over the phone. So they just don't get it. Yeah. And, and the, going the without breathing is not advised. Right. <laughs> free clinics aren't open on Sundays. Which Planned should? Parenthood isn't open on Sundays. For a lot of our patients, their only other option is the urgent care center or the emergency room, which are financially difficult for anybody of any income. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the question of uh, when are you open and for how long? And also in that period, how many patients do you usually see? Oh, mm -hmm. good question. So far, <laughs> so far we've been open every Sunday mm -hmm. and uh, from 12 to 4 during the winter months, from 1 to 5 during the summer months. We like to close earlier so that uh, in the winter so that our patients aren't trying to walk home in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Friday clinic that um, we will be opening up. We're still trying to figure out a place that has really good foot tra traffic for that one and that one uh, will be a three to five every Friday. Um, normally we have been treating and we discovered that what was really comfortable for us and for the patients was 20 to 24 patients during that four hour period but this last Sunday we had 42 patients and um, a lot of them required extraneous care. Two of them had to go to the hospital. Uh, some of them just needed, we just went out and treated them on the bench just so everyone needed to be treated. We're not sending anybody away and we have stayed past. Yeah, we often stay late. <laughs> but what are you gonna do? I mean, you just have to help people. Yeah. So that's what we do, but we'll have to, as the Word is getting out. We're just going to have to figure out a way to get more volunteers and more time. And I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but we'll figure it out. We're not going to the moon. We're just offering care. About how many volunteers and how many uh, doctors and other sort of medical help do you have at this point? We have four doctors at this point, and uh, we're always trolling for more. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of nurses. Yep. Yeah, we have, we a, have lot a lot of nursing students. We have some medical students and a pharmacy student. We have a pharmacist. Mm -hmm. What else? How um, many mental did you say the workers? nursing students? Uh, we have three confirmed mental health and then others that are um, going to be working into the system. We have a lot of people that are behind the scenes uh, working and helping us with grants. We have a cluster of three people that are working on just getting us 501c3 certified. We have people that like our um, bus Which means driver. The tax donations will then be, the yes. donation will be tax deductible. But okay. without, even without 501c3, the community has been just pouring out help to us. I mean, there is not a Sunday that goes by where someone hasn't come by at least with a big bottle of aspirin. Or one of the things that really meant a lot to me 
was we got a lot of donations and some people are very, very generous. And one gentleman had been our um, patient before and he was homeless and he said, I'm gonna find a way to give you money for this. And like, oh, sweetheart, you just spread the word. That's mm -hmm. all we want. You, I know what you have is what I see on you. So just spread the word, say nice things. That's what we really need. And he went out and he got a money order for what he could afford, which was $10. And he sent it to us in the mail <laughs> and I recognized his name. So I know who that was, but he didn't want us to make a big fuss about it. But $10 to him is really, really big. And he worked really hard for that one. That one made me get all <laughs> misty eyed. <laughs> but everyone supports us no matter what because they know that this is a service that is needed. And it's not only life saving in your physical life for some of these people, it just saves them in the quality of life that they have. You know, the turnaround that we see with people is is magnificent and I think sometimes all we're doing is giving them a hug <laughs> you know and sometimes that's all people need. For a lot of the patients that I've seen um, we also we're really keeping people out of the emergency room and we're we're preventing the hospitals from having to write off a lot of very expensive medical care by giving them immediate care. We've seen patients who needed surgeries and were able to obtain them because, mm -hmm. because we p connected them with the system. Uh, I saw a gentleman who I sent to a dermatologist, even though it was difficult for him to make that connection. He was diagnosed with a skin cancer that was treated. Oh, wow. If he hadn't stepped up to our bus, how long would it have been before he saw someone for that skin cancer? So we're really saving the community a tremendous amount of uh, money and resources and uh, lost time in people's lives, mm -hmm. you know? Every day that a person isn't sick in this community is a day that they can be a functioning, contributing member of society. Yep, definitely. And there are just some treasure people that come through that we adore helping and it makes us feel happy that we were able to connect with them. Of course, saving lives is wonderful and we will every week, you know, save more lives. <laughs> you know, that's not a problem, but it, it sometimes magnific magnificent. One gentleman came to us and he had a lot of stomach issues mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. he ended up needing um, s surgery to save his life. It was a condition that it, he had for about four years, I mm -hmm. recall. He didn't know what it was. He didn't have the resources to uh, get help. And we had to make a bunch of phone calls behind the scenes to really push him ahead mm -hmm. um, so he could get the surgery that he needed. And right now, he's in Hawaii. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Oh, oh really? yeah. Yeah, and he's riding a bike, uh -huh. which is really yeah. great. He sent me a post and said, this is the picture of the bike that I can now ride. Like when he came That's to us, great. he was walking like he this. He was a uh, young, strong man yeah. who was very disabled by a uh, hernia, mm -hmm. a, a major uh, ventral hernia, and was uh, obstructed. He really, it was, it was urgent it was surgery. life threatening, yeah. And boy, now he is the young, strong man that he was really supposed to be. Yep, he's a delightful young man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, you're looking obviously both for medical volunteers. Um, what can people in the community do that maybe don't have a medical background, but that would want to help out with Occupy Medical? Uh, well, we're always looking for more people to drive the bus itself. Uh, we need physical donations. Uh, we have a wish list on our website, which is occupymedics.wordpress.com. Okay. Dot com, yeah. Yeah, right. dot com. <laughs> and uh, we also have a Facebook page, and we'll update that. Um, we need people that can just come by and bring food donations or clean mm -hmm. socks or people that know how to work on the website or people that can take pictures or mm -hmm. people that can help us get more grants. Make photocopies. Yeah, people that know how to uh, work on the bus should something um, go wrong. Yep. People Mechanics, engineers, mm -hmm. roadies. Yeah, there's, yep. there's a lot. Setting up the tent is physically difficult yes, for us. Is. And I am not getting any younger. And you know, sometimes it is bone cold and we're dealing with metal poles. So yeah. just having someone come in to take down and set up the tent. People that um, are interested in just training people on how to do basic dental hygiene, proper teeth brushing, we I'd can like, train them. I'd like to put out a special call for dentists and veterinarians mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah, we did have a Saving Puppies in the Park Day in which um, we had parvo shots and we gave that to, to um, the everyone that came by with their little puppies and we'll have that one again. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. <laughs> Thanks.
I work to, you know, with people who need uh, emotional or psychological support, um, mostly in support of Occupy Medical or the medical staff. Um, so if somebody comes in here and they're, you know, agitated with possibly, you know, mental health symptoms, then I'll just help keep them calm so they can see the doctor and the nurses and go through our process. Because a lot of times what happens with people with symptoms like that is that, you know, their behavior is out of mainstream norms enough that they can't be seen by regular doctors. So um, when they come out, you know, come down here, we try to help them get the services they need and help them stay calm and and access what we have. Um, occasionally somebody will come through that the doctors or, or the herbalists um, will identify as somebody who could use somebody to talk to um, about anything. And so, you know, we do that as well. Um, we also just support the, um, the medical team with, um, you know, just logistical support. You know, if they need pens or staples or, you know, if the station one person who's doing intake needs something since she's kind of stuck at her desk, you know, we try to get it for her. So really we're just out here kind of just making things run smoothly and keeping things calm. So that's what we do. <laughs> and the first time I came down, I didn't do very much. I sorted pills and I listened and spoke to a few people and overheard conversations, but I went home to my innocent Iowa bred farm boy husband and I said, you know, the people who are homeless and struggling in this town, they have stories that would just floor you. They, these people have been through hell. Some of them starting when they were just little kids. A lot of the time their families are so unbelievably fragmented and dysfunctional that they they just didn't get any bringing up. They didn't get a fair start in life and they're still fighting it. You know, it's, it's hard to be empathetic if you've never had any related experience, but you know, a little sympathy. These people, a lot of them are real smart and a lot of them are good people and a lot of them are trying hard, but given what they're up against, it's, it's kind of amazing they're not doing more harm in the world. I got involved with Occupy uh, well even before it was called Occupy, when it was Empire State Rebellion and uh, um, Anonymous was uh, working on it and pointing out all the issues uh, that, we're, that we're talking about. And um, so I got involved with Occupy Dallas. Um, Occupy Dallas uh, had an encampment for 42 days, uh, during which time uh, I uh, played the role of uh, director of finance and uh, one of the camp coordinators. Um, the first thing that was really striking about Occupy was that uh, I'd never been involved with something where people just came together and spontaneously had m multiple problems to deal with, uh, problems that no one person had the answer to. And so we had to learn how to work together, which was difficult for a lot of people and is still difficult. Um, we still see these kind of things uh, going on where, you know, conflict between people that are working together causes problems. And so um, that's the big challenge that faces Occupy right now. And I'm uh, here to help out in any way I can uh, to help building that consensus-based process. Uh, the most important thing that we can do, uh, because we're protesting a system that we all disagree with, we uh, all are very passionate about uh, getting rid of uh, the problems that are out there and we each have our ideas um, but no one of us have the solution so yeah, it's imperative that we work together and engaging in that process it's a growth process with uh, pains and everything like that um, is uh, is really gratifying and the most fun thing that I've uh, ever done in my life so uh, I invite people to come out and see what uh, Occupy is about and get involved um, because we're here to create the solutions. Um, it, it may seem like we're here to complain about the problems, but the people that have engineered these problems are not gonna create the solutions. That's gonna be up to us. And that's a very exciting uh, process. And I hope people will get engaged, uh, get empowered, uh, and realize that they have something to contribute to the future. Um, you know, we're all just uh, people and there's only so much that we can do by ourselves. And so when we work together, 
uh, we're going to make the world a better place. But it's not always going to be easy. In fact, uh, the fact that it's not easy is what makes it worth doing. I think everyone is, is aware of when they go to a hairstylist and the stylist spends 30, 45 minutes to an hour, I used to spend an hour with my clients, how much better they would feel when they would leave. Not only about their, their hair, but they would just feel better. And I sort of made it one of my vows when I started doing hair that my clients would leave the salon feeling better than when they came in. And so that's one of my goals here. We have people sit down, sometimes in, in crises or very high stress, going through very difficult times. And this is a time when they have one person who's caring for them, touching their hair, and really caring for them and listening. And sometimes giving them a little bit of feedback. And it can be extremely therapeutic. Um, I've seen people who come to me over a period of time, and each time they seem to come back, they're in just a little bit different headspace in the relationship that we've built. And I'm talking of homeless people. Sometimes the first time they came to me, they were very, very kind of apprehensive about me and what I was going to be doing. And, you know, they just come and sit and plop and we talk and catch up. And I think it's a, a very important part of Occupy med Medical. It's just a little bit of mental health therapy as well. Down in California, uh, there's been a single-payer health care bill that's been introduced into the California legislature every year for at least the last decade. And what was happening is that both the House or the what they call the Assembly and the Senate would pass it, and then Arnold Schwarzenegger would veto it. Now that Jerry Brown is the governor, the House passed it, but the Senate didn't. And the interesting thing is that six Democratic senators who had voted for it in the past all didn't show up. But then the campaign reporting period came around and suddenly we found that $1.4 million had been given to them by pharmaceutical companies, health organizations, and you know related doctor groups and the like. And so they just uh, took a powder. So suddenly six votes in the Senate are missing and it fails to pass. If it had passed them, you know Jerry Brown would have signed it. It would have been tough going after that to find the money to make it happen in California, but the ball would have been rolling towards universal health care in California. And once something of that magnitude happens in California, it is going to be very difficult to stop it from happening across the country. So those six, through their acts, killed people. There is no way around that. So many people in our corporate structure today are making decisions on a daily basis where they're weighing somebody's life against their profit. Do have the list of the six of them. Let me read them for you. Let's go for it. Senator Ron Calderon, Lou Correa, Alex Padilla, uh, Michael Rubio, Juan Vargas, and Rod Wright. Total amount of money that it cost to buy those six was $1.434 million. So they have a return. Okay, that $1.4 million that they invested in order to continue every year making $54 billion works out to a percentage rate of return of 3,786,000%. Okay, I mean, that's a good investment. I mean, where else can you make an investment like that and uh, come out with a 3.7 million percent return? Welcome to Occupy TV. I'm Camilla Mortensen, and I'm here today with Daryl Cherney, producer of the new documentary, Who John Bombed Judy Berry. And I just want to start off with asking a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I've been an Earth First activist for about 25 years, working to save redwoods down in Humboldt County, California. Uh, I'm a singer-songwriter as well, wrote a lot of songs about the movement. Uh, 
I guess our big claim to fame is that along with Judy Barry, I was car bombed uh, in Oakland, California in 1990 while on tour to save the Redwoods, was arrested by the FBI and the Oakland police for bombing ourselves while on our way to a musical gig, uh, sued them and won $4 million at the end of the day. But along that journey, we were able to save Headwaters Forest and a number of other um, large areas of wilderness down in Northern California, which was really our primary mission to begin with. So tell me a little bit about the background on that, what was going on in the forests, and this was in the late 80s, I'm assuming? Late 80s, right into the early 90s. Um, the particular issue I was involved in, uh, a, a corporate takeover company, Max Sam, mm -hmm. uh, out of Houston, Texas, had uh, done a hostile takeover of Pacific Lumber, which was a venerable old company that had logged sustainably for 118 years. Uh, they tripled the logging. Uh, we started doing Earth First protests, uh, sitting in trees, blocking bulldozers, attending public hearings. More groups like the Sierra Club and uh, a group called Epic got involved to sue them. We really built it up to a pretty big frenzy. Uh, there was a, uh, a ballot initiative that uh, my larger circle created in 1990 called Forest Forever, which would have, if it had passed, reformed forest practices in all of uh, California. And that was a scenario uh, that occurred when we started to get death threats and ultimately were car bombed uh, while, as I said, on our way to UC Santa Cruz to do uh, speeches and a slideshow and play some music. So. Um Introduce us a little bit to Judy Berry and uh, her background and your history with her and what it led up to this, uh, or what you know of what led up to this car bombing. Yes, uh, Judy Berry uh, was a union organizer as well as an, an Earth First organizer. Uh, she actually led a couple strikes in the East Coast uh, with the United States Post Office as well as the Retail Clerks Union. Uh, she moved to California where she uh, morphed into an environmental activist. I met her while I was running for Congress in the Democratic primary in 1988, uh, she helped me design my brochure. Uh, she trashed me as uh, uh, for running for Congress to begin with, thinking I was a, an idiot, which she was probably right. And as she trashed me, she designed my brochure perfectly, and I fell in love with her really that moment. Uh, we started organizing together. She played the fiddle. I played the guitar. We were writing songs together. We organized demonstrations together. She was the mother of two children. She was a fiddler, as I mentioned, and also she was a carpenter, so she worked with wood. And because of that, she was able to talk to loggers and mill workers more than the average environmentalist. And she really uh, pioneered in, in huge ways the building of bridges between people who worked in the woods and people who were working to protect the environment, showing us that we had more in common with each other, perhaps today we might call that the 99%, that mm -hmm. we, had, <laughs> we had more in common with each other than say we did with the, the corporate bosses who were pretty much uh, running the show. Um, and then you mm -hmm. were, so you were with her the day of the bombing? Yes, uh, we were on a, a, a tour for Redwood Summer. We had received uh, so many death threats because we were going to bring thousands and did bring thousands of college kids and other activists to the North Coast. So we decided to go on tour of colleges to kind of get away from the North Coast, to get away from where we thought some of the threats were com coming from. And so as we got into her car in Oakland on May 24th, 1990, uh, we were actually on our way to pick up our banjo player and then head off to UC Santa Cruz uh, to do a college concert. As we, we pulled out of that, um, that street in Oakland, a bomb went off underneath her driver's seat, almost killing her. She was impaled in a car seat spring. Her pelvis was shattered, paralyzed right leg. She had intestinal damage. She uh, had a pulverized and dislocated coccyx and sacrum. She was almost killed by a miracle. I was only slightly injured with a couple busted eardrums and a few scratches. But immediately, the FBI showed up. I mean, like, instantly showed up and had us arrested with the Oakland police for being terrorists whose bomb had gone off accidentally. And that really, in some ways, was a defining moment in both of our lives. So they attempted to charge you with bombing yourself. Uh, that is correct. Uh, in fact, they knew immediately, they found the motion trigger, a little ball bearing that was sat in a cup because they pulled all the debris together. They knew immediately that this bomb would only go off in a moving car and, and that it was hidden underneath the, uh, the driver's seat where, where Judy sat. Uh, so it was hidden with a trigger that would only go off when the car moved. And knowing this, they still said that we were guilty of transporting explosives. Um, and they also said that nails that were strapped to the bomb matched nails in the back of Judy's car. Well, you may remember I just said that Judy was a carpenter. She actually was a foreman, and she called herself a foreman. Even though she was also a radical feminist, she preferred to call herself a foreman mm -hmm. of a six-man construction crew at California Yurts. So, yeah, she had nails in the back of her car, but those were roofing nails 
because in fact she was building a new roof, uh, putting on a new roof for the house she was moving into. And the nails strapped to the bomber finishing nails. So they didn't match either. The FBI and Oakland police lied from the f minute the bomb went off. They weren't mistaken. They didn't botch the investigation. They lied. And our lawsuit against them, which we did file, stated that they violated our freedom of speech, meaning that as government officials, they told lies about us to silence us. And then I understand that you uh, won that lawsuit, correct? Yes, it took uh, 12 years after the bomb went off for it to finally get to trial. But during that period of time, Judy Barry passed from cancer. And she died in 1997, seven years after the bombing, five years before we went to trial. Oh, wow. <clears throat> During, so she, just before she died, 30 days before, she gave her deathbed deposition, her testimony under oath that she, for a trial that she would never live to see. But on camera, she told her life story, which the jury would then get to see. Well, we took that deposition, boiled it down to a 93-minute documentary, and allowed Judy to tell her story in our movie, Who Bombed Judy Barry? And as she tells her story... We flash back and forth to the really hundreds of hours of archival footage that we had to draw from. And I understand that you have, uh, I think it sounded like there was quite an array of archival footage. you have anything from older mm -hmm. uh, film? And then also, I think there was, uh, I saw mention of Woody Harrelson climbing the Golden Gate Bridge. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we, we really had kind of an eco-paparazzi that follow, followed us around everywhere we went. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we were colorful characters, and the videographers knew that. Plus, as activists, especially as video came of age in the mid-1980s, that um, the, uh, the videographers started to show up to the demonstrations. You know, tree sits, costumes, uh, guerrilla theater made really good video. Mm -hmm. And we knew we were engaged in theatrics. It was almost like we, we were doing our demonstrations both to protect the forest by sitting in trees and blocking bulldozers, but also with the media in mind. So when we put this video footage together from about the 18 videographers that we worked with, we, uh, we had kind of tailor-made for a documentary film, very colorful and lively, often musical, archival footage. And I understand you've been uh, mm -hmm. traveling around showing the film? Um, I believe there was a recent showing in Eugene. I think you said that there's going to be another upcoming showing here in Eugene? Yes, we're going to be at the Public Interest uh, Environmental Law Conference mm -hmm. at the University of Oregon. We're actually showing on Saturday, February 2nd at 4 p.m. at one of the larger theaters. You have to go to the law conference to get the schedule. Mm -hmm. It's a big, big event here in Eugene. Uh, but yes, we've been traveling. We, I just came back from a tour of the Southwest. We were in Arizona, New Mexico, Albuquerque, Tucson, Santa Fe, Taos, Phoenix. We were all. We did 4,000 miles on that tour very recently. Right now, um, we're on our first leg of an Oregon tour, and we're doing Eugene and Portland as well as uh, Selma and Ashland. And when we do the Public Interest Law Conference uh, coming up on March 2nd, um, I don't know if I, I said the date correctly, but it's March 2nd, Saturday, March 2nd at mm -hmm. 4 p.m. Uh, we're then going to go up to Washington State as well as Newport Beach here in Oregon and Corvallis. So we're really uh, trying to get this movie out. You know, when you put your life and soul into a movie, you want people to see it. What sort of reception have you been getting? I imagine sort of uh, here in the Northwest, people are a little more familiar with the Timber Wars, but what about in the Southwest or other places where they're not as up on that? Well, you know, the Southwest really is Earth First country. Mm -hmm. So, to be, so um, to be fair, there are a lot of uh, people who have followed us down there. But in addition to that, uh, we did actually uh, apply for the Oscars. And in order to do that, you have to run for a week in New York and a week in L.A. And when you do that, you get automatically reviewed and we got great reviews from Variety, LA Times, uh, LA Weekly, Village Voice, uh, New York Daily News, um, Hollywood Reporter, so forth and so on. So the mainstream reviewers loved our movie and when we did play in New York and we also played DC, we've played Fort Lauderdale, Gainesville, Florida, we've been, we've been all over the place. We just did Bloomington, Indiana, although I did not attend that particular event. We have been getting great reviews. Here in the, uh, on the, on, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, I would say more often than not we get standing ovations. Oh, wow. And then you usually participate with a question and answer after the film. And That's right. I like to travel with the film whenever possible, and we do like a half an hour uh, question and answer, and people have a lot of questions, and they pretty much stay glued to their seats. What are some of the more interesting questions that you've gotten about the film? Well, you know, who bombed Judy Barry? People want to know who bombed Judy Barry. Right. And while our film doesn't answer that question, we have a parallel ongoing um, uh, court uh, 
motion, although actually it's starting to be resolved right now with the FBI to have some of the more revealing evidence tested. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, uh, when we received our money, we had an agreement to take a little less money in exchange for us being allowed to test the evidence once they were done with it. Well, to make a long story short, after a lot of battles, um, we just had the evidence delivered to a laboratory of our choosing, Forensic Analytical Sciences, where bomb fragments, then actually, not to give away too much, but there were two bombs, not one, made by the bomber who bombed us. And the first bomb, not the one in Judy's car, but the first one, has about eight to, to 16 feet of duct tape on it, and we think that duct tape could have fingerprints or DNA samples, you know, from hitting the hair or fingerprints. And so we are, as we speak, in the process of having, uh, having evidence that could identify the bomber, forensically tested, and then uploaded to the federal database. So, if it's not giving too much away, why do you think that uh, mm. the mystery of who bombed that car uh, hasn't been solved yet? Well, we know for a fact that the FBI doesn't want it solved. They actually announced they were going to incinerate that evidence, and we had to get a court order to stop it because we actually had an agreement to have it tested. So we had a court order, uh, two court orders, as a matter of fact, that took over two years to, to wind its way through the system. Um, my personal belief is that the FBI is covering the tracks of who bombed us. Maybe it's an asset. You know, they, they have tended to work with snitches and informants to do their dirty work. Maybe they're covering up for somebody. Maybe they know who did it. Uh, or maybe they're just engaging in a CYA. They don't want to admit the fact that they, you know, just blew the whole thing. But regardless of that, uh, the FBI has a long history of repression of political activism right up to the present day, starting with the unions mm -hmm. back in the in 19 teens and working their way up to the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement against all the different wars, uh, the McCarthy era, uh, the right up to the present day, the American Indian movement, the Black Panthers, all brutally suppressed by the FBI. In a sense, people tend to think the FBI solves kidnappings when in reality they are America's political police force. Which actually leads to my next question, which is, is there, uh, what do you think that, the contem that contemporary activists can learn from this film and from your experiences? Well, I'm glad you asked that because we made this film to first and foremost educate people of tactics and strategies. Judy Barry was a master strategist and a brilliant orator. She, and and she, she was brilliant because she could really encapsulate complicated concepts into really simple, simple phrases that, that, that belied how complex the thinking really was behind them. Secondly, we want to inspire people because our movie is one of victory. We beat the FBI. We saved Headwaters Forest. We expanded the Cotto Wilderness by 18,000 acres. We got people to quit their jobs over, over this issue. And, and, we, and we continue to expose. We're continuing to investigate the evidence. So it's a movie about success and victory. And thirdly, we want to really teach people who Judy Barry is and who she was mm -hmm. as a brilliant feminist environmental labor organizer. Uh, she is an inspirational peop uh, person in a world where we have too few heroes, especially too few women heroes. Judy Barry needs to stand out. I believe she deserves to stand out as a shining example to us all. Lastly, we want this movie to instigate an investigation of the bombing. We really want to see a, a legitimate law enforcement investigation because no matter how hard we work on the DNA, we don't have the power of search warrant or subpoena. We can't drag somebody into the police station. We need um, an agency to help us. We hope this movie will help tr inspire a that to happen. Now, is there a certain, uh, I guess, sadness or poignancy to having so many of these things resolve after uh, Judy Berry had already died? Well, <clears throat> the world is filled with tragedies. You know, we're, you know our, the suffering that Judy Berry and, and myself went through was really you know, e either comparable or even less than what people go through in Iraq and Afghanistan and in China and in Africa. All over the world, people are suffering greatly. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's taken 22, 23 years for us to get to this point, uh, you know, is comparable to, say, solving the Birmingham church bombings uh, 40 years later or the assassination of Medgar Evers, the great civil rights leader, 35 years later. So, you know, patience is a great virtue and time really is on our side. They say that the losers have long memories. And so, and not that we were the losers so much, but we were the ones who got attacked, not the attackers. And so I have a long memory, and I plan on bringing this case to justice. And uh, were there more recent developments in the case, or is that the most recent development that the FBI is starting to hand over some of the evidence? 
Well, you know, the recent developments in the case, in addition to us being able to test the evidence, is we are offering a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest, uh, conviction, and incarceration of the bomber. Uh, that information is on our website, whobombedjudybarry.com. That's J-U-D-I-B-A-R-I.com. The eyes have it. And so I'd like to think that between the reward, the testing of the evidence, and the documentary film that's come out, uh, that we are trying to create a perfect storm uh, to solve this bombing case. And is there a statute of limitations on it? Or is it, uh, I guess, is it, is it more of a legal closure? Or is it more of a, I don't know if I'd call it an emotional closure to the case? Well, it's both. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's certainly, I... While I've kept a good sense of humor about things and kept an optimistic viewpoint, I'm pissed. You know, really tremendously angered and not going to let this go. You know, you don't bomb Judy Barry, you don't bomb me, and, 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 and watch us walk away. Uh, but the statute of limitations is not up on attempted murder, especially attempted murder with an explosive device, mm -hmm. which is an entirely separate charge. Uh, further, there is the possibility that ongoing ongoing crimes are being committed for example obstruction of justice mm -hmm. and so i would like to see this case criminally prosecuted uh, and so we uh, we move forward and we just try to do the right thing there's no guarantee that we're going to find dna evidence or fingerprints or that we if we do find out who it is that that person will even be alive or that uh, that we'll be able to move forward but you do what you can in this world and this world needs all the help it can get um, and given the current political climate, if something like this had happened more recently, um, would you, do you think he would have been charged as, for example, a domestic terrorist for the bombing? Well, if it had happened more recently, the situation would have absolutely been more grave. Mm -hmm. The country has really become much more uh, totalitarian, if I may say, uh, recently with these draconian laws, you know, the Patriot Act, just, you know, the Animal um, Enterprise Act. I mean, all these different acts that are coming down, limiting our free speech, uh, increasing sentences. Uh, I know people, I know a, a woman who's in jail for 22 years, whereas if it had happened, uh, say, 20 years ago, she would have been in jail for two years. Uh, when, um, so, so sentences that used to be one week or two weeks are now one year or two year. Sentences that used to be two year are now 22 years. But more importantly, we might not have been able to file our lawsuit. The FBI's documents would have been kept more secret. They would have had more leeway to do what they did to us without recrimination, even if we had been found innocent, which, of course, we were. Even if they had been proven to be lying, they would have more than likely gotten off the hook today. And so that's one of the reasons I think our movie, Who Bombed Judy Barry, is so important, because it, it just allows the light of truth to be shown in an example where the FBI got caught red-handed. And for folks who may not be able to uh, attend the conference, um, I think the schedule for that's at peelc.org. Um, are there other ways that they can access the film, either buy a copy or rent or download a copy? Yes, we haven't gone download yet because we're still showing it in theaters, mm -hmm. but advanced copies are available, again, at whobombedjudybarry.com. We also have our Facebook page where you can communicate and follow where we're going at, at whobombedjudybarry. And, uh, you know, since they are here in Eugene and we're going to be at prime time Saturday, 4 o'clock at the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference, as you mentioned, P, that's a hell of an initial, P -I -E -L -C, uh, dot org, uh, dot org uh, where they can, you know, find out more about it. But uh, I, I encourage them to show up. And uh, what would be, in, in 30 seconds or less, what would be a, the, the takeaway you'd like to have for folks for this film? We can win. The earth is being slaughtered right now. It's being hammered. And yet there is a, a line in one of our closing songs that says, together we can defy the end of the world. And I believe where there's life, there's hope. And so even though things are grim, the ice caps are melting, the ozone layer is still thinning, people are being you know, slaughtered all over the world, we are still alive. We still have a great attitude. And I think we can still turn this thing around. This movie provides us with some of the tools that it will, will enable us to be able to do that. Thank you so much. And you've been watching Occupy TV with Daryl Cherney, the filmmaker of Who Bombed Judy Berry. Hi, my name is Kerry Thompson, and I've been uh, with Occupy since uh, pretty much since its inception. Uh, it started out with a huge march that so we had 2,000 people. and ended up here, right here in the park blocks, and uh, spent the first week with the camping and, and uh, lots of uh, 
uh, activities and actions. Started out doing a lot of bank, uh, going over to some of the big banks and making actions there and ended up switch your uh, money from the banks under the credit unions and that was a big success around the country. Uh, since then Occupy has spun off a lot of uh, really nice activities. One of them being this wonderful uh, Occupy medical bus here that uh, serves uh, both the homeless and people that can't, uh, can't afford or access regular medical care. And also there's uh, this wonderful uh, Eugene Occupier newsletter that comes out once every couple of months. It's around town. You can come down, you know, to the bus station or uh, some other places, the library, and find a uh, addition for yourself. It has a lot of the activities that are going on and uh, what, what uh, other articles of, of interest to occupiers. The uh, Occupy camp that happened at Washington Jefferson Park attracted a lot of homeless folks and uh, so that homeless issue came up again because the, the need is so great now that it uh, Occupy spun off uh, what's now Opportunity Village and Sleeps, a couple of groups are going to have a village this summer uh, at Garfield and also Sleeps is working on the camping ban and modifying the camping ban which has come before the city council and hopefully something will be done to this really tough problem that there's no legal place to sleep for people. Also, the bank busters have, uh, w keep working on the banks and their issues, the big banks that are too big to fail and that kind of screw people over. And go to your local credit unions, folks. Also, foreclosure committee has helped the foreclosure with people with foreclosures here in town. And, uh, there's been a few people that have really been helped. We had uh, occupied a, a place at 12th uh, and uh, Lawrence for the, called the Outpost for uh, three or four months and helped uh, keep that property up and got it back to the person that owned it in better shape than they left it. So there's lots of things going on. And, uh, you know, come down, there's always volunteer opportunities, as I say, in the newsletter here. And also, I forgot to mention the wonderful media group that's working on, you know, both the radio and the television. Channel 29, Occupy TV every week, and then our radio shows too. So, plenty of stuff going on. Get involved, get the paper, and rock on. That's it for this episode. Thank you for joining us here on Occupy TV.